Lenny. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, we are going to get started in just a second, but if you're you're just joining us, you're you're in, in the right place, provided you're here for the shoulder talk. <laughs> um, if you're here for the shoulder talk, you are in the right place. This is the Lower Columbia Canoe Club safety talk, um, the third safety talk in a series of five. Tonight we're going to be talking about shoulders and how to keep them healthy and well so that you can paddle for a long, long time. And we are expecting a little bit of a crowd, so I'm just going to give it another minute or two to let a few more people come in out of the waiting room. But if you're just joining us, hello and welcome. guys are so good to show up at five o'clock, five o'clock out here in the West Coast. I know we've got folks from many different time zones. We so, so, so appreciate having the opportunity to gather with you, even if it's only virtually. Um, a lot of us at the Lower Columbia Canoe Club, again, I'm Deborah Kane. I'm the president of the Lower Columbia Canoe Club, if you don't know me, and we've just grown really fond of these talks. It's a nice way to connect with um, members of the club as well as, as you know, many of you who are joining us from parts far and wide. Um, Teresa's just put a little question into the chat wondering where folks are from. Um, the more we host these free online discussions about, you know, topics that are of interest to fellow boating enthusiasts, we, we tend to keep grabbing people from lots of different states and even countries so it's super fun um i'm gonna give it one more minute i still have a few more people i need to get in <laughs> including will gare who Teresa told me would be my helper <laughs> <laughs> i should i should let him in if he's gonna be of help <laughs> maybe he will help <laughs> we'll we'll the night is young welcome will um all right, everyone. Again, I'm Deborah Kane. I'm the president of the Lower Columbia Canoe Club, and we have a really full agenda tonight. So I am not going to spend the usual amount of time that I spend um, telling you about the club and our programming. I will simply say we are a paddling club based in Portland, Oregon. We have paddlers of all different kinds, kayaks, canoes, sups, um, IKs, all of it. Um, our membership is largely made up of folks in the Pacific Northwest, but increasingly as we do more of these free online talks, we're, we're picking up members from all across the country. Um, I'm going to probably be putting some notes in the chat tonight about why you might consider joining the club if you're not already a member. Um, and I'm going to direct you to our website where you can learn a lot more. Um, usually these talks are 75 minutes, you know, start on time, end at the 75 minute mark. It turns out there's a lot to say about shoulders. <laughs> Who knew? Um, we've got four expert speakers. We've got videos. We've got slides. So tonight's presentation is probably going to run a little beyond that 75 minute mark. If you need to go, you know, don't even think twice about it. Um, and know that we are recording the session. So you know, if you if you missed the last 15 minutes, we'll be sure. Um, to get a recording or a link to the recording out to anybody who had signed up on Zoom. So you'll see it as soon as it's available. And again, thank you for joining us. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Teresa to introduce her speakers. Teresa is the safety chair and a longtime board member of the Lower Columbia Canoe Club and a good friend of mine. Teresa. Yay. Makes me so glad. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I have some wonderful humans here to talk about shoulders today, and I'm going to introduce them in the order that I see them on my screen. Um, the first one I see is Gavin Casson, and he's an engineer and a hand paddler. And I met him through a girlfriend, I think. Um, <laughs> and he has had, I would say, uh, more than his share of recurrent dislocations in one life. And so he has quite a few stories in that department and a lot of experience with surgeries. Um, would you like to say something, Gavin? Sure, yeah. Um, thanks, Teresa. Um, and yeah, as, as Teresa said, I think I'm on the panel as the what not to do portion <laughs> of the panel. Um, 
I have Very had important. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had um, you know, long story short, a multitude of injuries that have resulted in four shoulder surgeries, two on each shoulder. Um, the most recent was last February, so I'm a year out and and um, pretty much uh, back to paddling now. Not not full speed, but getting pretty close. And uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, I think that's my kind of point of view on things and, and offering that I have for the panel. Wonderful. And the next person I see is um, Olivia. Oh, what's your last name again? Linny, Olivia Linny. And she is an MD here in Portland, Oregon. And uh, she, she specializes in wilderness medicine and emergency medicine. And she also works up at Meadows, uh, taking care of people who break their bones on their way down the ski hill. And she's also a whitewater kayaker. I happen to know. <laughs> and would you like to say hello, Lenny? Hi, everyone. I've been fortunate enough in paddling to not have any personal serious shoulder injuries, but I do take care of them. So hopefully I can add some insight that way. And I'm super happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Nice. And next up is Anna Levesque. Am I saying your name right? Levesque? It's Levesque. Levesque, but yeah, There's, I don't say yeah. the S, that's why the I S is silent. Levesque, <laughs> thank you for correcting me. Um, and Anna has a business called Mind Body Paddle where she does kayak coaching. And I know that several of my girlfriends have taken her clinics and found them amazing. And she also has written the book on yoga for paddlers. And uh, that is an amazing book. So uh, you want to say hi, Anna? Yeah, hi, and thanks for having me tonight. It's great to see everyone. There's so many folks here. And like Olivia, I've, well, I've been paddling for 27 years and knock on wood, I haven't had any shoulder injuries. And I chalk that up to probably good shoulders um, and also consistent action over time and taking care, of, taking care of my shoulders and really paying attention to my body um, and getting what it needs to be able to be out there and stay injury free. Mm -hmm. So stoked to be here. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Good example for us all. And then next up is Jacob Sealander, who I know is a geologist. Um, and I recently acquired his most recent book, which is about the geology of our region. It's wonderful. It's got lots of color pictures, uh, <laughs> just what I need. Um, but he also is a paddler who managed to destroy his shoulder, it sounds like multiple times in the course of his life, and remain a competitive level paddler in slalom and wild water racing, uh, which is an unlikely combination to blow out your shoulders and still be able to race. So <laughs> what have you to say about that, Jacob? Uh, I, I think since, since I've had so many shoulder injuries, um, I haven't, I've only had one surgery to fix it so far. <laughs> um, I, I, I have a feeling there's another one in the future, um, but I've really kind of focused a lot more on my technique and kind of be more conscious about that as I'm paddling um, to really keep my shoulders in, in a more protected position. And I've kind of adjusted my paddling style um, mm -hmm. to fit my shoulder health. And I've also kind of concentrate a lot more on like keeping the shoulders healthy and doing a lot, a lot of um, let's call it preventative maintenance mm -hmm. on them to, to keep them in good shape. Mm -hmm. And even without a presentation to offer, I think that the, the few people we have here at the top of the screen could talk about this for the rest of the night and all day tomorrow and the next day too. So without further ado, I'm gonna switch over to sharing my screen and flip through some slides. And I invite all of my panelists to simply chime in whenever it seems like the right time. I'm not always good at queuing, but uh, we'll, we'll figure it out as we go along. Here goes the screen share. All right, shoulder for paddlers. Can you guys see that? One person say yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Here's the pictures I came up with. Oh, the one person I didn't introduce is Jessie Stone in the bottom right corner there. And that's because she couldn't come to be on the panel live. Um, she's also an MD and she's down in Africa somewhere. Now I can't remember which country. 
um, but she's working on um, malaria down there. But she was a competitive uh, freestyle paddler and she also had three shoulder surgeries before she started kayaking. So she had um, some things to say about that. And I have at least one video of hers to share about specifics about shoulder stuff. Let's see, getting started. What we're gonna cover tonight, we're gonna definitely cover dislocations with just a brief glancing blow at a lot of different ways you can hurt your shoulders and really a, a strong focus on form and fitness in order to avoid injury and also fitness to just maintain strength and integrity. And then at the very end, we'll talk a little bit, if we make it that far, about the medical options if you decide that you can't do it without surgery. You know, where are you going? What's next? Um, if you have questions, please type them into the chat window instead of unmuting yourself, at least initially. And I cannot see the chat window when I am screen sharing. So all of my panelists and Deborah, you're invited to um, monitor the chat and, and bring forward any interesting questions you see there. I would love that. Um, yeah, a little disclaimer, these are not medical recommendations. Well, I'm a doctor and so is Olivia, but we can't tell you what to do if we haven't examined you and seen your exact situation. So it all depends on 10 million little variables and each situation is different. So you still are responsible for your own choices. And this bottom bit about the Good Samaritan law, when I uh, did the Wilderness First Responder Certification, they talked about it a lot as what was most protective of a person who's trying to help out someone out in the wilderness when maybe the outcomes aren't always perfect. So, you know, it's something to know about, something to look into if you plan to help by doing first aid on people in the wilderness. Start with the shoulder is a vulnerable joint and it's vulnerable because it's the most mobile, least stable joint in the body. It's a little bitty shallow dish with a big knob at the top of your arm bone that rests in there and it's held in place by just a bunch of soft tissue really. Um, and in kayaking, we often end up in the position that's most likely to dislocate it, which is right here. It's with the arm up and the arm back that's where the shoulder takes only meh, 12 pounds plus or minus to pop that thing out. So we try to avoid that position. There's the joint, the ball and socket joint, a very shallow one. Another joint that gets injured and is part of the shoulder but is not the shoulder joint is the AC joint and that's where your shoulder bone or your scapula actually has the acromion process meets up with the uh, collarbone. And that is often injured. Another place that's often injured, and this is more of a paddling injury, is the long head of the biceps, which runs in that groove along the front of the arm bone, the humerus, um, can get torn, frayed, and it can yank on the labrum, which is the connective tissue inside the joint, and kind of put rips in it. So all of those are ways that you can get injured. I'm going to skip all that. Here's a list of possible injuries to the shoulder. There are many. How many of these have we not had? I have, I have had labrum tear, bicipital tendon frayed, tendonitis, tendinosis, bursitis, arthritis, subluxation, rotator cuff injuries. I've not had an AC separation. I've not dislocated my shoulder. That's it for me. Where is Deborah? Are you there? I'm trying to stop the share. Sorry, I'm muted. I'm here for you. I'm trying to stop my share and I can't even see to do it. This is very hard to do. Okay, no, did I stop? You did, you did great, Teresa. So you Yay. would like for me to play one of your videos, I believe? Yeah, I would love to see. This is, um, would you like video one, two or three? One, number one, please. It's about okay. nine minutes long. It's Jesse Stone talking about generalities about the shoulder joint, followed up by um, some about the difference between tendonitis and tendinosis. And it's good. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Jesse Stone, founder of Soft Power Health 
and five-time member of the U.S. Women's Freestyle Kayak Team. I'm here to talk to you about shoulders today, and it's a massive subject, so I'm only going to talk about one specific area, which has to do with tendonitis versus tendinosis. If you are a paddler, these, both of these conditions are going to be something that you will encounter in your lifetime as a paddler. And if you want to continue paddling for your whole life long, you will need to address these correctly. So first things about the shoulder that I'm going to mention are the shoulder obviously is essential to paddling. Um, it is both the most hypermobile joint in your body, but also the most unstable. Like many other joints in the body, it's a ball and socket joint, but the socket is very shallow. The ball, the humeral head sits very loosely in the socket and it is stabilized there by a system of tendons and ligaments and muscles. So many people have heard of the rotator cuff, which is made up of four very small muscles. That's its primary function is to stabilize the head of the humerus in the socket of the shoulder. Um, the ligaments are very essential as well to keep the shoulder head in the socket. So you have a series, series of glenohumeral ligaments that keep the head of the humerus from popping out. Today, we're specifically going to address frequent types of tendonitis and tendinosis in the shoulder. Um, typically, the two most common areas that are affected by both tendonitis and tendinosis are the supraspinatus muscle, which is one of the four muscles in the rotator cuff and sits at the top of the front of your shoulder. And it overlaps over the top of it. Um, and then there is the biceps tendon, which also comes from the top of the humeral head down into the biceps muscle and is responsible to help the biceps with its function, which is flexion of your arm. Okay, so what's going on here with tendonitis versus tendinosis? Typically, tendonitis is associated with an acute incident that happens a specific thing you can think of in your mind. Ooh, I did that high brace, ouch, or I picked something up and ooh, I heard a pop or whatever. Tendinosis is strictly an overuse syndrome, if you will. It's small micro tears, micro injuries to the complex of tendons or specifically to certain members of the rotator cuff group like the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, or the subscapularis. Um, and it's not associated with an inflammatory condition the way we think of tendonitis. So tendonitis in particular um, is the tendon sheath being angry and injured and inflammatory markers being there and relieved by rest and ibuprofen, icing, things like that. Tendinosis, one of the interesting things is that there are no typical hallmarks of inflammation with tendinosis. So when they have looked microscopically at the tissue for tendinosis, they do not see inflammatory markers in the tissue. What they do see is disorganized collagen being laid down because your tendons and your ligaments um, are comprised largely of collagen. And so they see this type three, which is early collagen laid down and no type one collagen laid down. And they see it in a very disorganized fashion. And in addition to that, they see a lot of disorganized vascularity. So that's blood delivery to the tissue. And repeated injury is what is thought to lead to this without adequate healing time. So. All right, how do we address these conditions so that we can get move forward and keep paddling and not feel pain and not have weakness and not be worried? Okay, number one thing is rest. And so with tendonitis, it's a shorter duration. It's anywhere from one to six weeks of rest. 
And then with tendinosis, it's a longer duration. It can be up to nine months, but typically it's somewhere between three months and six months that you need to rest from your typical activity or activity that is producing pain. Pain is a very important guide here and you need to follow it if you really wanna heal. The good news is that you can make a complete recovery, but it involves patience. So that's probably the hardest part for all of us. Okay, other things you can do to help your recovery and improve your strength along the way. One of them is stretching and strengthening. So you can embark on a course of stretching and strengthening, and I'm gonna separately show you some exercises for stretching and gently strengthening um, the shoulder during tendinosis. This is really tendinosis. You can try it in tendinitis too, but specifically for tendinosis. And in addition to that, you want to, whenever you're sitting at a desk or working at your computer, you want to be very mindful of good biomechanics. How are you sitting there? Are you slouched forward? This is going to put a lot of strain on your shoulder. Are you sitting up nicely with the shoulder sitting properly back in the joint as it's supposed to be? We as paddlers tend to be very internally rotated with our shoulders. What does that mean? That means the humeral head sits forward in the joint which is not the normal anatomy. We want to encourage it to sit back in the joint and sitting at a desk encourages it also to roll forward. So biomechanics, a physical therapist can also help you address this more specifically if you want more details. Um, other things that really help are massage, cross fiber friction massage of the shoulder is thought to bring in blood and healing mediators to the tissue so we like that we want to do that um, other things that are really good nutrition so what are you putting into your body for to make proper collagen you need to include in your diet vitamin c zinc b6 and manganese and finally vitamin e so make sure that you are supplementing that into your diet during the healing period it's probably going to help you anyway the rest of your life but it's uh, certainly to help make the proper type of collagen and to expedite healing in general. Uh, other things that are very helpful are icing. Icing has been thought to address the issue of the disorganized vascularity and certainly for pain. And of course, if you're having a lot of pain, you can take NSAIDs, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, but you do not want to embark on a long course of that because one, they don't help the healing process, which is newsflash, newsflash. This is, this is uh, very contrary to typical thoughts for tendinosis, tendinitis, since it's thought to be more inflammatory, it can reduce the swelling and reduce inflammation, but with tendinosis, no. And so along these lines, cortisone shots have been used to help these tendons in the shoulder and other parts of your body, but what they have actually been found to do in the long term, long term is impede the laying down of the collagen and the healing process so that you're more likely to rupture farther down the line. Mm -hmm. So what I would say to you is, um, if you can possibly avoid a cortisone injection, do. If you can be patient enough to go through this healing process, please choose that pathway. Um, everybody has to know for themselves, but just to give you a few heads up, thank you very much for your time. I'm going to show you some exercises in the next video and feel free to send me any questions. You can reach me at jesse, J-E-S-S-I-E at softpowerhealth.org. And I look forward to seeing you on the river. Bye. I feel certain many of us sat up more correctly. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard a lot of things that my panelists have said in there too. So I thought it was good. Do you have anything to add to what Jesse said? I have something to add, Teresa, quickly. Yeah. What I And what Deborah just said is sitting up straight. The one thing for me, and we talked about it the other night among the panelists is is notice your habit patterns off the water. Your habit patterns off the water are really playing into your shoulder health, your, your back comfort. Um, and so sometimes we like to, 
isolate things like, well, I'm going to think about kayaking and how to heal my shoulder for kayaking or, and, and we think in these silos, but the, the habit patterns that y'all have off the water are, are either hindering your body being healthy or helping it to be healthy in paddling. Mm -hmm. Like sitting up straight, just what Jesse said. Yeah, I noticed half the audience was shifting in their seats to a more better posture when you said that. <laughs> Any other panelists want to pipe in? No? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just um one one quick thing that kind of to piggyback on what, what Anna and Jesse were saying. Um, it, it's kind of a really hard habit to get into of just being conscious of where your body's at and what, what position different parts of your body are in when you're sitting still. And then what, it gets even harder when you're moving. Um, but if that's kind of a habit that you start developing now that you're starting to think about it, um, eventually the, you'll get to that, that stage where it's, you'll be conscious of your body position and movements without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so true. All right. Well, are you guys ready to move into shoulder dislocation? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do the share thing again. And this is really Olivia's territory because she's done a lot more of this than me. So would you like to speak to any of this, Olivia? Um, sure, I can do that. Uh, so uh, as Teresa's slides say, the most commonly, the most common direction that a shoulder will dislocate is anteriorly, meaning the humeral head slides forward um, instead of backwards. The posterior shoulder dislocations pretty rare, usually car accidents, seizures, things like that, mechanisms that aren't current, uh, normally encountered with kayaking. So um, if a shoulder dislocation occurs while whitewater kayaking, it's nearly always an anterior dislocation which is good because those are the easier ones to reduce. Um, there can be all sorts of mechanisms as we, I kind of discussed already. Um, the more dislocations you've had before, the easier it is to dislocate again in general. Um, and yeah, these, these are pictures of what it looks like for an anterior versus a posterior dislocation. Here it is. Yeah, so this is a chart um, about actually then the age at which the first dislocation occurs um, dictates how likely it is to happen again. So as you can see on the chart, if you if your first time dislocation is during your teenage years, there's a super high recurrence rate versus if you happen to be specifically over the age of 30 is one of the cutoffs, there's a much lower risk of a recurrence rate of dislocation. Um, so mm -hmm. um, it certainly does matter the age at which your first dislocation happens, how likely it is to happen again. I'm curious, uh, Jacob and Gavin are our recurrent dislocators on our panel. What was the age at which you first dislocated your shoulder? I think I was 33, oh. 32 or 33. Is Gavin still here? Yeah, I'm still here. I think I was, I think I was 19. Okay, so you fit into this statistic, Gavin. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Let's see. How do you know it's dislocated, Olivia? So there's a bunch of ways to tell. Not any one way is 100% perfect. Uh, almost everyone who has a dislocation will feel like it hurts. Sometimes they'll feel like um, it's out of place. I find that kayakers have a higher body awareness than the average patient. So sometimes they feel like their arm's not moving properly and they, they just know it's out. Um, but you can tell a few ways. One is um, you can physically look at the shoulder joint. There will often be in people who are skinny and um, uh, you can see that the, the shoulder joint is not where it should be. That said, that can be kind of difficult to do. If someone's wearing a dry top or a dry suit, it can be hard to really get in there and be able to see or feel it through all the material. So while that's worth checking, that's not 100%. Um, another way that I like to tell is by very gently trying to see if I'm able to get the shoulder joint to rotate or move people who have shoulder dislocations in particular will, um, not be able to easily externally rotate. So I don't know if you guys can see me, but 
um, moving the shoulder out into the side. Yeah, like Teresa is demonstrating, that direction is a very difficult direction for someone to move in if they have a shoulder dislocation. So it's not going to be moving properly. And again, if you're trying to do this exam, you want to be very, very careful and not, not force anything. Um, but that, that is the main way that I'm usually able to tell. And you can keep your, your hand on the humeral head to be able to slide it around and feel if it's moving. Uh, let's see the other things Teresa said. Um, arm on dislocated side, won't settle next to the ribs. Um, oftentimes people will be holding their hand kind of out like this. Um, although it can also dislocate where they have their hand above their head as well. So position can be a cue, but is not perfect. Uh, all right. I think that covers it. Wait, Olivia, quick question, um, that, that came in related to the, the slide that showed the, um, dislocation rate after a certain age, like if you've had your first one at 19, like poor Gavin, um, do you, do you have any insight on the explanation for that? Like, what, what is that about? Good question. I would have to look that up to be certain, but off the top of my head, I would think, well, first of all, there's probably a bit of a confounder that the older you are, um, you know, if you're, if you're 50 years old, when you dislocate your shoulder for the first time, you're probably less active than a 20 year old. So maybe that could be part of a confounder, but I think there's also something to do with the actual stability of the joint. I think as you get older, your ligaments and your tendons get a little bit more tense. They tighten up a little bit. There's just a little bit more stability to the shoulder. That would be my guess. But again, I'd have to look that answer up to know for sure. Thank you. This is an image. I guess the left one is pretty clear. You can see the little dimple that the head of the humerus is supposed to rest in and it isn't there. And when it's all the way dislocated, it'll slip all the way forward until it's against the ribs. Yeah. Okay, this is you also, Olivia. How to do a shoulder exam? Or did okay. you do it already? We talked a little bit about it, but I think um, importantly, you want to check, um, you know, if someone's had a serious traumatic injury and they've dislocated your shoulder, um, you want to make sure that they didn't have any other injuries, which means inspecting them from head to toe, making sure, you know, they don't also, they didn't also break their leg or hit their head or something else that you're missing out on. Cause it could be a distracting injury where they're so focused on their shoulder. There could be something else. So checking them over, mm -hmm. making sure you're not just focusing in on the injury at hand. Um, and then once you're looking at the shoulder specifically, um, it's good to check for, um, sensation specifically with a shoulder dislocation, the axillary nerve is the most common nerve that's injured. And that provides sensation to that area, um, in the picture. So, um, touching them there, making sure they're able to feel it. If they don't have sensation there or they have numbness somewhere else in their arm, that can imply that there's some kind of nerve injury that happened with the dislocation. Um, also, it can be good, especially if you've had any kind of medical training and you know how to do this to check for a radial pulse um, on the wrist. And it's reassuring if you feel one and less reassuring if you don't, but um, a good thing to check for if that's something you know how to do. And Teresa's pointing to the spot you okay. want to check it. Um, I will say a common thing people do when they're feeling for a radial pulse is they put too much pressure and they actually compress the radial artery and then you're not going to feel a pulse. So just very gentle pressure when you're feeling. <laughs> yeah. Don't squash it flat. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So if the shoulder's dislocated, yours or someone else, what do you do? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, this is kind of a controversial topic, um, about what to do if you think someone has a shoulder dislocation, because, the technical textbook medical answer is don't do anything, take them to a hospital, wait till they get an x-ray because they could have a fracture. And if they have a fracture and you're yanking on it and you're not medically trained, you're risking damaging their nerves and their arteries and their bones and pulling everything in a place that shouldn't be. And that's the standard answer. That said, I think the answer is a little more complicated for us kayakers because we are often going to these terribly remote places where you know, just calling a rescue isn't always a viable option. And, you know, having someone's shoulder out could actually increase the hazard to both themselves and the team at hand. And the example I want to give is um, a friend of mine dislocated his shoulder in a deep canyon in California on a class five run. And the way out was either hiking 1500 feet up a cliff with no trail 
with a dislocated shoulder versus getting it back in so he could continue downstream and finish the run. And while I would never recommend that someone paddle on a shoulder that's recently been put in, he was stuck between two really, really bad options, neither of which were optimal. And, you know, in the end, a decision had to be made. And so I think that's part of what we do. We have to make these tough decisions for ourselves. And, you know, what we choose is not always going to be the most medically optimal situation, but you kind of have to weigh all of these things and make the decision for yourself about what to do. So that's kind of what these slides are getting at. I think um, I have a couple rules of thumb for when you definitely wouldn't want to try and attempt a relocation. Um, one would be if there's, if this isn't something that occurred kayaking, there was something weird that happened, like they fell while they were scouting or they hit a giant rock directly on their shoulder when they flipped their boat over, or there was a severe trauma or something else that's just not typical because I think that those things have a higher risk of, um, you know, causing a fracture or just having a more atypical injury. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think those would be some, some big no, no's. And then, um, Teresa's point, if it's, if you suspect that it's somehow a posterior dislocation, again, that would be an atypical mechanism that would probably cause that. And then if you have an easy evacuation option, like you're right by the road, you're half a mile from takeout, they can walk, they can get in the car, load them up, go to the hospital. Um, I think that that makes the most sense. So if you have an easy evacuation, then it's better to just take them and have that checked out. And then, um, you know, times where you maybe should think about it. Like I said, if you're really far from help, if the shoulder's going to be out for hours and hours and hours, the longer a joint's out, the more damage it's going to be causing to the nerves and vessels and the more kind of long-term injury that you're risking. So those would be kind of things to, to kind of weigh to make that decision. Um, let's see. So I think, yeah. Oh, here's the slide. I think that we just talked about that. Oh, and one other thing is if um, they're having weird sensory changes, like they can't feel their arm or you are feeling for the sensation, they don't have it there, or you're trained to feel a pulse and you don't feel one, um, those would all be things that would suggest that there's a more serious neurovascular injury and maybe you should think about giving it a try. So you would be more likely to reduce it if you thought there was an impingement to a blood vessel or a nerve than if it was not impinging on anything. Yeah. Yep. And this um, says the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the longer the shoulder joint is out, the harder it is to put back in because the muscles get tense and they start to uh, resist pulling on them and it just becomes a lot more tight and difficult. So if you, are deciding that you think it makes the most sense to attempt reduction, doing it earlier is better. And it feels so much better, right, Gavin? <laughs> it always kind of baffles me when I hear people say that they don't know if their shoulder's dislocated or not, because to me, it's <laughs> such a very distinct, you know, it's a really distinct feeling. It, it's almost like even if you've never had it done, as soon as your shoulder dislocates, it seems to me like most of the time, if it's happening to you, like, you know, it's dislocated. You have that standard, like, look that everybody has with their arm kind of down at their side in front of them. And it's, you know, it, it's incredibly painful. Um, and there is an immediate relief when you do get it put back in place. Yeah. Would you agree with that, Jacob? I, I would. I, I can remember my first dislocation very, very vividly, and it was incredibly painful when it happened. I knew exactly what it was, even though I'd never dislocated a shoulder before. Uh -huh. um, I was able to, to, to self-diagnose what it was because I had a, a, a lump where I didn't nor used to have a lump on my shoulder. Yeah. Um, but as soon as it was reduced, the, the pain just drops dramatically. Like even after a few repeated um, dislocations and, and reductions that, that it's still painful to dislocate it. And then it's still the same amount of just drop in pain when it goes back in. So. Yeah. Cool. Let's see. Olivia. All right. So we talked about the risks already. Um, I will say that the 
the power of massage here cannot be understated. So this is something that can be performed by anyone, not necessarily someone who's been trained in reduction or not. They can just come and start massaging the shoulder, massaging the neck, all of those surrounding muscle groups to get them nice and loosened. And they can continue doing that during the reduction procedure as well. And then um, getting the patient in a place where they're feeling really relaxed and not stressed because the last thing you want is for them to be resisting you with their muscles. And so getting them to a place where they're feeling calm um, and the more time someone dislocates, the easier it's actually going to be to get it to go back in again. Um, the more muscle someone has, the harder it's going to be to overcome it, to put it back in. Just something to know. All right. And the bit about the woofer, woofer WFR, that's a wilderness first responder. It's a 70 hour training in which regular people, everybody, the general public can learn how to reduce the shoulder as well as a few other really handy things like green flagging is fine. All right. Um, and then we are, uh, I think we we're going to go over, um, Teresa told me, Gavin, that you, when you dislocate, have a method um, that you prefer, which I think is a very good one um, for kind of giving your, your knee a hug and leaning back on it to try and get the shoulder back in. I was wondering if you could demonstrate that. I really like this method because it allows the person who dislocated their shoulder to decide what force they want to put on it and kind of um, do the procedure themselves so that you're not pulling on someone's shoulder, you're not putting force on it, um, and they're kind of able to ease themselves into the reduction on their own. So I don't know if everyone's able to see Gavin's screen, but I want him to demonstrate it. I think, Teresa, if you- Can I stop, stop sharing? Yeah, exactly. Oh. Oh, we have that's a picture too. That. Well, that's my picture. Is that good, or you want to use yours? That I mean, that's the general idea. So we can just that's, we that's, can just roll with it. Okay. All right. So yeah, okay. I mean, essentially, that you know, that picture is the general idea, and this is you know, this this is a method that I've used to put my own shoulder back into place. Um, it works really well. I've talked people through it um as well in, in other scenarios um you know it's i think it's always better if the person can reduce the shoulder themselves and you know that that second bullet there the importance of relaxation is kind of what i want to drive home and, and so essentially you know kind of like the picture shows you want to lock your fingers together and and you know kind of use the non-injured hand to hold the, you know, let's pretend that my left shoulder is dislocated. I'm going to use my right hand to hold the, my left hand. And then you kind of rest them in that knee and you just kind of lean back into it and use your knee to put that traction on it. And, it's, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a ton of force. You can slowly start to increase the force on your shoulder, you know, and, and see how much it takes to put it back in. But if you don't relax, it doesn't work. Um, it, it doesn't work at all if you don't relax and that can be tension in your wrist. Um, you know, it, it, surprisingly enough, even if you're just tensing up your wrist down there on your left arm, that'll keep, sometimes keep it from going back into place. And certainly, you know, if there's a bend in your bicep and you're tensing up, um, you know, in your elbow area and in your bicep, that's going to, for whatever reason, and I don't, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I don't necessarily know exactly why it doesn't work, but if you don't relax, it doesn't go back in. So you really have to just kind of somehow put your mental state into a different place where you're not going through this pain and find a way to relax and just breathe through it and a good exhale and some steady pressure. Um, it'll slide back in, you know, I've had pretty good success with this method and, and, and talking through talking other people through it as well. So I highlighted a couple of points Gavin made. I think the biggest thing is having patience with whatever method you're using, because it's not like some people think where you're just pulling on it and then it pops back in. It's kind of this gradual process of fatiguing the muscle groups, because what's happening is you're sliding the humeral head around the rim of the cup. So for a moment, you're having to get around this rim and back in to a place where it's more stable. And that involves being able to fatigue those muscle groups. So that's why massaging helps relax them and just having that gentle, steady pressure rather than pulling really hard at any given moment, just very gentle, steady pressure to really get everything relaxed and to a point where it will come back in. And then to speak to Terry's question, um, 
occasionally when I do reductions, you do get that satisfying pop and you know it's back in, but almost more often than not, it's a gradual kind of process and the patient may feel better right away. And they might say, oh, I think it's back in and they might feel better, but they, they might not. They might be kind of a more gradual process over the period of minutes where they start to feel better. So you might not get that satisfying clunk. You may or may not. You can, if you want, put your hand, your finger on um, the head of the shoulder joint to feel it. And sometimes you'll be able to feel it slide back in place. And that can be another clue that it's back in. Um, and then I will also say, even if you don't think the reduction was successful, you always want to repeat your shoulder exam again at the end and make sure that they still have blood flow, that they still have sensation. Um, it's always good to recheck those things after you've manipulated someone's shoulder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jacob, have you used a similar message or method or, or something entirely different? I, I, I've used a similar method. Um, another, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, so this is not medical advice, uh, but this is just a story of a method that I've used to help reduce my own shoulder. Um, if you have, or what, what I've done before is laid down on, on a flat rock or block or table and it's let my, my, my dislocated arm basically drop down towards the floor. And then if you can add a little bit, what I've done is add a little bit of traction to that arm as it's hanging down and just the, the gravity plus a little bit of traction has, has pulled the humeral head down and allowed it the, um, the, the stretch tendons to pull it back into place. Yeah, sounds like about the same position, just a different, um, like holding a, or strapping a jug of water to your hand or that kind of. Yeah, basically, if, if you took the, the image that's that's on the screen and rotated it about 90 degrees, so he'd be yeah. laying down on something, that's yeah. it's kind of, kind of the, the exact same process. Okay, cool. And I just want to say about this photo that this is like three rapids up from where that last dislocation happened. <laughs> this was before. This was, I was after. Still, I, was still, I was still smiling in that first. Yeah, picture. you were smiling. It was a good day. <laughs> Uh, this is the general woofer thing, tiring out the muscles. Yep. Okay, after shoulders reduced. Sling it. Do we go back to your slinging slide, Olivia? Uh, yeah, we can do that. Uh, they make, so they do make commercially available, they're called cravats, and they're these little triangular slings that you can buy. You can bring those with you. I don't tend to carry one because I feel like this can be easily improvised and hopefully depending on who you're paddling with, isn't something that's happening all the time. Um, so I tend to just um, be able to improvise that you can use a t-shirt or whatever you have with you to design it. Right. But the basic a idea is, pin, yeah. Right. And a exactly. It's all you need. Exactly. All right. Let's see, try to avoid using the shoulder. Would you agree with that? Yeah, so try and avoid using it, keep it in the sling. Um, make sure you go get medical evaluation. Either way, whether it was successfully reduced or not, you wanna get it checked out. You wanna get an X-ray. You wanna make sure there aren't any other problems. So seek medical evaluation. Um, and then you also wanna make sure to follow up with your own personal doctor in case you need certain referrals, orthopedics or physical therapy or whatever it is you're gonna be doing to recover from your injury. And this last bullet point, I think is super important. Gotta pick a good doctor, someone who knows shoulders because a lot of doctors don't really. Is Anna still with us? I think yeah, I'm here. Be... Oh, okay. I just wondered. <laughs> I haven't heard from you in a while. I guess I'll read this one. When your shoulder starts healing, shoulders are slow. Shoulders don't heal quickly. Even if it wasn't dislocated, even if it was just a little tweak or a twinge, it can take months sometimes to feel better. And so don't lose hope. Don't give up just because it still hurts, but give it time. It needs a lot of time. And if you do get a dislocation or any other injury that ends up sending you to a physical therapist, 
that physical therapy is probably the most important thing out of all of the things on this list for getting your shoulder working again. I've got bands right here. Stretchy bands. You guys have seen these, right? And, uh, and I was told years ago by a man who was in his 80s and still kayaking that he used this one particular workout for his rotator cuff using bands. And it was the reason why he was still kayaking at 80. And I hope to be like him. And the reason for the minimal use of the NSAIDs has to do with the same thing that what Dr. Jesse said in her video about the cortisone shots. It results, if you take ibuprofen, aspirin, Aleve, um, any of these kinds of drugs uh, consistently for a long time, it actually inhibits your strongest cortis or, um, now I'm losing the word, connective tissue. What's the stuff it's made out of? Collagen. It inhibits the strongest collagen from being deposited. You get a weaker collagen to start with and it takes longer to transition to being strong. So it's better not to take them if you can stand to avoid them. Hey, this is you, Gavin. I left all your words in there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is one of the things that, um, you know, I, I, it's shoulder injuries for, you know, I, I wouldn't wish what I've been through on my worst enemy just to start with. I mean, four shoulder surgeries is just a lot um, to deal with. And, but even just one, um, you know, th these were things that I dealt with, um, e even from my first shoulder injury. Um, and, and for the record, none of my, my shoulders did not originate, you know, these problems didn't originate from kayaking. Um, they have been completely exacerbated by kayaking and raft guiding for eight years. Um, those things definitely did not help, but my shoulder injuries did not originate from kayaking, but it takes a lot to keep your shoulders in health and in, in good health. And, and, you know, it was kind of inevitable for me. It seemed like after the history that I had, once I started kayaking, I was going to have things happen again. And so I was left with the only option as being surgery. And so surgeries have long recoveries and, you know, it can really, for somebody like me, and I'm sure it's like many of you as well, um, you know, these are the things that you do to stay sane in the first place is going kayaking and riding your mountain bike and going skiing. You know, it's how you break away and how you, you know, really enjoy your life and, and the things that you love. And now all of a sudden you can't do any of those things. So, you know, it really takes, you know, some extra effort, I think, to just stay mentally healthy during your recovery, because if you don't, it's going to limit your comeback as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do, do something extra, whatever it might be, learn a new hobby, you know, maybe reach out to friends that you haven't talked to in a little while, um, you know, maybe even some non-paddling friends or family members or something, you know, anything you can do to kind of help your mental health during your recovery stage. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately, like, be patient with yourself. Don't rush back too early. Um, I've seen a lot of people come back right when their doctor tells them that they're good to go. They just, they get really excited because they've been sidelined for six months and the doctor gave them the green light. But, you know, what the doctor was probably saying was it's okay to start easing back in, but they come back in full bore and they get hurt within just the first couple of weeks of return and they end up back in the, you know, back in the doctor's office again. Um, so honestly, I tend to at this point, especially lean way on the conservative side of recovery. Um, you know, you can do most normal activities within a few months of surgery, but kayaking is not a normal activity. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, so don't rush back. I know you're antsy. I know you want to paddle, but be patient with yourself because you're in this for the long run. Um, and then when you get back and you're starting to paddle, like, you know, don't let your ego get the best of you. Um, we all have one. Uh, there's no way around it. If you're paddling whitewater, you probably have a little bit of an ego just to talk yourself into running big rapids. Sometimes you've got to believe in yourself and you've done this for a lot of times. And now you're standing next to this rapid that you've ran a whole bunch of times and you have, you know, a thought in the back of your head that you're a little bit worried uh, about, let's say it's a hole or something like that, that you weren't worried about before because 
you know you have the skill set to work out a said hole if you get beat down in it or there's a big pool behind it so what's it matter if i get surfed in this hole and swim into the eddy you know um but now all of a sudden maybe your shoulder can't really handle that beat down or maybe you're not sure if your shoulder can handle that beat down it's okay to walk like let let your ego go walk the rapid um you just you really i can't stress enough to just when you're coming back from an injury you have to be patient you have to take more time than's recommended most of the time and then you know slowly as you work your way back in what i've found is just you know one day after you know a few months of coming back into it i'll realize that i went kayaking for a day and didn't think about my shoulder and that's a really good sign you know that that's that's when you're that's when you've started kind of working yourself back in to not having that in the back of your head anymore and it takes you know i mean like i said i'm a year out from my last surgery i think i started paddling again in november i'm still mostly just paddling class three four stuff right now and intend to do that until probably the summer or so and then i'll start slowly stepping up from there but you know it's a year plus recovery for most shoulder surgeries even though you can go back to most normal activity in four to six months I think we should jump. I want to hear from Anna before you have to leave. And I know that you have managed to paddle for a really long time without ever dislocating your shoulder and having immediately taken care of your own injuries. Um, how did you do it? Well, before I, I want to really, Gavin, what you just said was awesome. And I think that it's so important yes. for us as paddlers to hear. And so thank you for saying all that um, and addressing that. So for myself, I've created a lot of self-awareness. Um, I started practicing yoga, you know, 25 years ago, pretty much the same time that I started paddling. And for me, as I said in the beginning, the self-awareness of what I'm doing off the water re really helps so working on posture, right? Working on the, you know, having those shoulder, noticing when the shoulders are rolled forward. And the truth is, if we really look at it, we all love paddling and paddling is still sitting, right? So if you sit at a desk for work and then you sit in your car to drive to the river and then you sit in your kayak to paddle, it's all the same body position. And that can really compromise not only the shoulders but the back as well and so it's really important to incorporate opposite action and opposite body positions to uh to to that sitting position and how i do that is focus on focusing on opening the front of the body and strengthening the back of the body specifically strengthening the rhomboids in the back so that they can help to keep the shoulders back right? And strengthening the glutes as well, which doesn't have much to do with shoulders, but if you strengthen your glutes and stretch your, your uh, quads and hip flexors, your back will feel a lot better too. And so it's really about uh, introducing opposite action. And, and, and that's true for our health and wellness. Anytime our body is out of balance, when, if we can look at what the balance is and incorporate the opposite action, whether that's in diet, as Jesse mentioned, uh, movement positioning, that'll go a long way. And as paddlers, I just want to focus in on something Gavin said, you know, he talked about ego, uh, sometimes, um, paddlers are also, we tend to be all or nothing types of folks. So, you know, oh, you know, we have <clears throat> with the being patient, we might need to just walk and practice yoga or stretch or do our PT for several months, right? Even if we haven't fully dislocated our shoulder, even if our shoulder is tweaked and we can really feel like if I keep pushing it, if I keep pushing it, I'm going to injure it more, right? To, to kind of let go of our all or nothing attitude and what really makes a difference. And this is true reaching paddling goals or any goals is consistent small action over time, right? None of us became class four or five boaters like that, not overnight. 
right? Or what, wh however, whatever level of voter you are, right? You didn't, that didn't happen overnight. It happened over time, small, you know, every day you, you went paddling, you gained experience, you gained skill. So it's the same thing with taking care of our bodies. So 10, I tell my clients, my coaching clients and my, uh, my in kayak students, right? If 10 minutes of yoga, four or five days a week is better than going to one, one hour class of yoga uh, once a week, right? If you're really wanting to take care of your body, you know, going for a 20 minute walk every day will do more for your health than, you know, take going for a run one hour once a week, right? So, so I, I wanted to introduce that concept of dialing it back on the all or nothing and get it, it goes hand in hand with Gavin's being patient. So much about the human factor. The yeah. And if, and for specific shoulder stuff, my book yoga for paddling, I'll just, it has a, I just want to say it has a stand up paddle board or a sup yoga on the cover and some pad, some whitewater paddlers that really turns them off. The book is not about sup yoga. The publisher, I had to fight with them. They fought me. They wanted the sup yoga person on the book, but it's really about yoga for paddling. <laughs> so it has opening the front of the body and strengthening the back of the body. Gavin's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> you mean supping's not paddling? <laughs> Sup no, supping is paddling. I love both, but yeah. I, I think it's sad that the publisher was so like, you know, adamant about that. Yeah. This is your concept too. Where is your boat, body, and paddle? Yeah, I think that was, is that Jacob talked a lot about that as well. Is that Jacob's concept? And then the Does idea of, you know, if you're not aware of your body, then you can learn by debriefing. By Jacob, is that you? I mean, it, it could be, but Anne, if, if you have to run and you have some stuff to say, go for it. No, I think it's, um, yeah, body awareness is huge. And I love what you talk about in terms of, of technique for paddling. And I'm sure Jacob will, I know Jacob will get to this, but we talk about torso rotation to help protect the shoulders because the as we talked about the shoulders are are weak the core is strong and we want to power our boats with our core and the core isn't just the belly button it's also the pelvic floor the pelvis so there's a lot more than just rotation in from the the belly button and um that goes with the roll surfing um so that's what I'll say right now. Awesome. And posture, posture. I always tell my students to press down through their sits bones. And you'll notice if you do that, the knees will come up into the um, thigh braces even more engaged, which is super cool. Mm -hmm. Absolutely crucial for balancing in a boat. Yeah. I think we've made it up to the cube. <laughs> I used, I learned the box, right? That your, your hands are supposed to stay in front of a plane created by your shoulders and inside of a plane. I, don't, I never really fully understood the box, but now I hear that it's the cube that we're paying attention to in order to maintain proper shoulder alignment. Jacob? Yeah, I, I think it's not I, I think that the cube is just something that, that I like to, to tell people when, when they're paddling just to, um, as a thing to think about to keep your shoulders in a position where they are the least likely to pop out of place where, to, where, where the shoulder joint, because it, it is like one of the most mobile joints in the body and that therefore it's kind of the, one of the easiest to, to pop out of place. Um, but there are, we'll call them safe, orientations for the shoulder joint with respect to the rest of the body, and then orientations that are more likely to dislocate. And if you think of the, kind of the orientation where the shoulder is most likely to dislocate, it's when, when the elbow goes behind the plane of the shoulder and, and your upper body. Um, so one thing that I've, I've been thinking about 
uh, when, when paddling in when coaching people on their forward stroke or coaching people in slalom uh, is kind of the idea of this paddler's cube. Uh, so that's not so much um, a, a specific like paddler's box. You have to be here, elbows at 90 degrees all, all the time on the paddle and so on that some of us learned 20 some years ago, uh, but more just a, a range of locations where your elbow can be that keeps your shoulder in a more protected position. So if you have your arm kind of straight out from your body and have your shoulder or elbow bent at 90 degrees, that forms kind of one side and the top of your, of your cube. And then if you take your, your shoulders from being out away from your, or your elbow out away from your body and bring that down towards your hip, that forms another, your upper and lower arm kind of form the other side of that cube. And as long as your elbow is within that cube, your shoulder is staying in a much more protected position. Uh, so one, one thing that, that I've personally been doing to really um, try to reduce the number of times that my shoulder pops out or reduce the, the risk to that is wh whenever I'm paddling, kind of concentrating on keeping my elbows down and within that, that, that safe range. And if that means I have to train myself not to high brace anymore, that means I have to train myself not to high brace anymore. Um, and you use a low brace instead, or uh, if you think kind of some back to old, some, some kind of classic slalom moves, you have, you have this dufex stroke where you see some of the really good slalom paddlers and their wrist is way behind their head. Um, that's okay when you're like 20 <laughs> and, and, and you're training to do that. But when you start getting older and your shoulders um, are at the same level of fitness as they were there in when you were 20, this really puts your shoulder in a very, very vulnerable position. Um, so it's a more of kind of like rethinking where your, your paddle has to be, where your hands have to be, where your forearms have to be in order to keep your elbow within that range of kind of safe positions for your shoulder or where it's significantly less likely to dislocate. Okay, so it's okay that his hand is not inside the cube. Yeah, it's okay if your hand is not inside the cube. As long as, long as your elbow stays in there, you, have, you still have full, full range of motion of where your, your hand and your forearm can go. Okay, all right. And then what, one, one reason, um, th th this particular slide, um, this is, a, if anyone's a, a flat water paddler or a surf ski paddler, this is Oscar Chalupski. He's a, a, from South Africa. He's been paddling surf ski for probably 400 years or so. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure anymore. Um, <laughs> But he still gets out and paddles 200, 300 days a year. Wow. Um, and one, one thing it, it, that it's really fun to watch him paddle is because he, he keeps his elbows in that protective position. And in order to get a lot of power out of his stroke, he relies primarily on his torso rotation. So as, as you're rotating your torso, that little cube of protected space for your elbow, that rotates as well. So if you need to... Uh, we'll probably get to this later, but if you need to throw in a quick rudder while you're surfing, if you just throw your elbow behind your back, you're instantly out of that protected position. Mm -hmm. But if you take your whole, whole torso and rotate it, then you can you can keep that that cube of, of safe locations and still get in that proper rud rudder stroke or directional con control stroke that you need to make. Awesome. I'm going to use that. Here's Mr. Rotation. He's got his shoulders almost in line with the boat. So I have uh, to follow a, a bunch of just photographs of paddlers in different positions. And I thought I'd rip through these and see what you guys have to say about them. Um, oh, Anna, this was my moment to bring in your rotation video if you had it ready. How do I stop sharing when I can't see my mouse? Ah, there it is. Sorry, there, I'm unmuted. Okay. I just want to show this and you can, well, oh, not that one. So this is uh, on the green and I just want to, and I, so this is a narrow river. This is the sneak at go left. And right here, um, I my bow starts to go and right here, can everyone see this by the way or no? That's better. <laughs> You're seeing my, 
You can you see it? Or you can see it in your big messy desktop. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. You're getting close. Oh yeah, my desktop is messy. I know that's really <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> I didn't crap. Mine is too. They all are. I know. So right here, can you all see? And I know I'm looking ahead, but can you see? It's kind of like what Jacob is saying. Like my body is rotated. Can you yeah. sort of see that? You're and my, left. I'm not just, I'm not just. What I see most people who flip and also a lot of, uh, you know, injuries because they come oh, from flipping oh is people trying to go down the river ruddering like this with their body facing straight ahead. Can you hear me or is there too much background noise? I can hear yeah. you. Okay, good. Where the, the pad, they're just like here. And what is this? This is the setup for the roll essentially, right? Uh -huh. So as soon as you turn your body and twist, it's a lot, it's a lot more effective right if you really need to use that if you really need to use that rudder does that make sense and the same thing with surfing so here's another one i'm sure you can see my messy desktop but um with surfing here like same thing right here i know it's hard to see with the pov but i'm pushing my blade my bottom blade away from me do you see yeah like when i'm ruddering to surf it's not just leaning back and sticking it back here i don't know if this is helpful i was hoping it would be a little helpful right and same thing here so i'm keeping my elbows down when i'm surfing and everything in front of me kind of like what jacob was saying and using my edges a lot That's yeah. what I got for you. I'll stop sharing. Okay. I know what you're getting at. I don't know if it was totally visible and it looks like your computer's running out of batteries. <laughs> Thanks. I'm being vulnerable, y'all. You are. And now I can't get uh, stop share. <laughs> well done, well done. All right. Let me see. So this this fellow, we were looking at him. He he's kind of an example of a torso pointed forward, and the arms are out to the side, and his back elbow is not in the cube. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. His back elbow is in the danger zone. And then I found this. Yes, he's got a very narrow grip on his paddle. I agree, and his torso is rotated more. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of our local paddler boys, even Kendrick. And this is our very own Olivia, rotated after a huge boof stroke. And I don't have the next photograph in here, but when, when she hits, she lands with no twist in her spine, but her left blade is planted, ready to twist the other way and pull forward. So that was a nice rotation. And this is the master Steve Fisher with his shoulders twisted in line with his boat almost. So backing up, I, the point that I wanted to make here, this is Alan Douglas in the canoe, is that when you're paddling in a canoe and you only have one blade on one side, you have to be able to rotate because in order to turn away from your bl blade, you must be able to do a stern draw. And a stern draw can only be done with a huge amount of rotation. So you've got to rotate to rudder properly and you've got to rotate to do a stern draw to turn the opposite direction from the rudder. Very important in canoeing. So rolling is one time when we can be kind of uptight and maybe distracted from our perfect technique, but it's a time when if we practice enough uh, maybe we'll get <laughs> a point where we can do it. This is the most common error is lifting the head first. And this puts quite a load on the shoulders. And this is a very old illustration from an American Whitewater Journal uh, showing in the three line, the three ABC is the proper technique where you actually go down, push down with your head instead of lifting it up to take the load off of your arm when you're rolling. The point in all of this is just that practice makes perfect. And I learned since we talked that this is the standard way that the ACA is teaching the role now. 
This is how you're supposed to finish the roll with the ACA. Anybody know know any different? Can I say something about that? I'm actually yeah. the chair of the of the ACA SEIC, yeah. <laughs> which is the Safety Education Instruction Council. So yeah. I that's not the case. So the ACA is it's very like much that. there are a couple of there's no one there's no one way right there's no right or wrong in paddling there's no like there's no right way to paddle there's effective and ineffective and depending on someone's body body shape body type and there are going to be a few different effective ways and so um this is a big subject but there is no ACA way to oh, uh, finish the role or to do the role. And if anyone has any questions for me, if you all are ACA instructors and you have questions about ACA curricula or criteria, I'm gonna put my email in the chat and I've got to run. So I appreciate the time. Thank you, Teresa and Thank Gavin you. and Jacob and Deborah. And if anyone has any questions, my email is in the, I'm gonna put it in the chat. We so appreciate you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, I, I, I might chime in on um, proper form on, on a role and kind of to continue on Anna's thoughts. Like since the, there's like an infinite number of paddlers out there, so there's an infinite number of paddling styles and techniques that work for each individual. Um, so my, my personal thoughts are when you're rolling or paddling, if it gets you down the river, if the stroke gets you to where you need to be on, in a rapid, uh, if your roll gets you back upright, um, keeps your body in a protected position, especially your shoulders, it's working. And, and you should you should go go with that. Yeah. Teresa, just one more note on rolling really quick. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, I try not to speak very much on paddle technique because I'm a hand paddler and I don't really know what to do with stick <laughs> but I think this translates pretty well between the two um, so one thing that I have tried to do throughout the years was train myself to stop doing back deck rolls um, they're very convenient they can be very quick um, but if you have shoulder injuries um, I do think that they can expose you to uh, uh, you know, they, they expose you to more pressure and they do put your shoulder in that awkward position where you're very far out of that cube. Um, and that is exactly what happened in my last dislocation where my shoulder failed was, you know, instinct kicked in in a certain scenario. I'd been doing a lot of play boating over the summer and I tend to do a little bit more back deck rolling when I'm play boating um, because you find yourself in that awkward position over the back of your deck a little bit more often and I let myself get out of the habit and it, and it caught me. I, you know, Star Creek boat and ended up in a sticky, you know, in a, in a odd angle and blew a shoulder out. So, you know, my two cents is there's plenty of ways to roll and there's nothing wrong with the back deck roll. If you do it right, I know it can be taught properly, but in, you know, my opinion, it, it, if you have already have shoulder injuries and, or if you're just trying to like figure it out on your own, that is one, way to roll that I think can really make you vulnerable to shoulder injury. So if you're going to learn to use that back deck roll, um, I try not to use it at all. But if, if you're bound and determined to figure out how to do it, I would definitely say get some instruction on how to protect yourself while you're trying to do a back deck roll. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll second that um, if, if you're just learning a back deck roll, because it's very easy to learn a back deck roll without instruction where your elbow is way up here. Uh, but you can also kind of retrain yourself so you're doing a back deck roll with your hand more in front of your face. Um, but again, a back deck roll is something that, that we use when, when, we're, when we're play boating or we need to get upright in a, in a hurry and we're not necessarily thinking about, okay, is my hand here or is my hand here? Like is, is my shoulder, is my elbow up or is my elbow down? Right. Like, it, it all comes back to that being aware of where your body is and, and how it's moving and where it's going, even when you're you know, getting chundered in a hole or, 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 or beat on an eddy line. It's good to be, be aware of where your body's at to keep uh, that risk of injuring your shoulder or putting yourself in a compromised position down. Mm -hmm. All right, anything to add, Olivia? 
No, I think that's been covered pretty well. All right, I think we got the role. I have to say that for myself, I have hand paddled a little bit too. And I tweak my shoulders more often hand paddling than I do with the stick. I feel safer with the stick. So <laughs> very personal preference thing. So bracing, this is an area of hot debate and I have no um, expectations of us agreeing on anything. But again, here's a photograph of someone who, oopsie, dropped into a hole and they're side surfing it. This is where I tend to hurt my shoulders is when I'm in a hole unexpectedly for a long time. And, uh, you know, the brace can deteriorate. So how, how do you keep your braces good? Here's another desperation brace. Check this guy out. I think this is on the Ocoee, I'm not sure. But um, this guy in the stern is starting with a low brace, but he's about to flip over and completely uh, switch over to a high brace and then rip his arm right off. <laughs> it doesn't look good for him. He's going over. That kid's not going to help him. This is young Adam Clausen doing a low brace in a C1, and that's a beautiful low brace. Both of his shoulders are well above the paddle. Here's another high brace in a canoe, and he's going to go over. Olivia, what do you say about this one? Are you still here? Yep, I'm still here. Uh, I think it's very similar to the other pictures we've shown where she's rapidly getting her elbow outside of the box and putting it in that dangerous position. Okay, because I mean, you said that about this and then when I was looking at it, I was like, well, it doesn't look that dangerous. That elbow's a little bit away from the ribs, but not terribly. Yeah, I don't think it's terrible for him. I think it's much better than the other pictures you've shown. Um, yeah. It's really just, if she were to put that elbow up any higher and then her paddle blade hit a rock, that would be a pretty vulnerable position. Right. Okay. This is what I would consider a vulnerable position. And this is what we all do when we first start paddling and we hit a big hole, right? Like, ah, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> and then this is an example of a low brace with the elbows up. And I mean, how does that apply to the cube concept? Is this still in the cube? Yeah, as, as long as the elbow is staying in front of the, the plane of, of the shoulders and, and the spine, that's uh -huh. that's still okay. It's probably not the most effective low brace, but it, it can still it can still work. Mm -hmm. What's the most effective low brace? The one that keeps you from uh, the one that keeps <laughs> your head above water. <laughs> Like that one. Yeah. Doesn't he look comfortable and confident? He's like, yeah, I just ran seven foot falls in an open boat full of water and I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> so that's all the braces. Now on to landing from drops. This is our dear Shannon Crosswhite down in Mexico not too long ago. And she's run a lot of waterfalls, so she's looking pretty comfortable. Here's um Oh, Aniel Cerasoles. I just picked another picture of him because it, he, I'm a fan. And he's doing the thing that I have been taught since I moved here to the Pacific Northwest, which is to build a house. You go over the waterfall with a house. And that would be elbows below shoulders, hands below elbows. And I didn't really think much of it until I was running Horseshoe Falls, which is this waterfall on the left, and I had my elbows down low, and I, I landed in a boat that boofed better than I was used to, and I banged my elbow on the deck of the boat so hard that something hurt. And instead of being smart like Anna and staying home, the next weekend I went to Canyon Creek and ran Kahuna, and I didn't hit my elbow on the boat, but something ripped again in the same place. And later on, it took a while, I went to the doctor to try and find out what was wrong with my shoulder because I couldn't palpate anything. And it turned out I had torn my subscapularis, which is the muscle that's on the underside of the scapula, the shoulder blade, so you can't palpate it. It's like hidden between the bone and the ribs. And if you tear that, you can't pat your own belly. And that's when I learned what the subscapularis does. Anyway, onward, fitness for injury prevention. We've talked about all this stuff, haven't we? 
core strength and stability. And this thing is open the front body, strengthen the back body. And then shoulder girdle strength is all the muscles that the big muscles that stabilize your collarbone, your shoulder blades, and you know, the whole complex of your shoulder girdle. Rotator cuff, which we haven't really talked about, and I don't know if we have time for it. Um, but I, I have a whole lecture about the rotator cuff in me for some day. <laughs> and twisting strength, people don't really understand that the muscles that make us twist, like if you just sit in one place and twist, the muscles that are doing that are all along the spine, really close to the spine. And they're the same muscles that help your vertebrae stay lined up under an impact. And so like if you're gonna run waterfalls, for example, then twisting is a good way to get the strength that you need to keep your back healthy when you're running waterfalls. All that's aside the fact you know, of shoulder health. So I'll keep going. This is open the front body. The muscle that pulls the shoulder forward into Sasquatch position is pectoralis minor. And there's a picture of it right there. And that little muscle is the one that has to be stretched in order to keep your shoulders back. Yes, you strengthen the rhomboids in the back and you have to lengthen that muscle. And here are a couple of exercises for strengthening the back body. And really it's just arching up on your belly. Eyes, Ys, and Ts is what we're talking about. So if you're laying on your belly and lifting your arms up, then you're strengthening all of the extensors in your back and a whole lot of the muscles around your shoulder blades, which are very important for stability. Someone asked earlier about swinging from a pull-up bar, hanging from your hands. And I'm of the opinion that it, it is very helpful for maintaining shoulder integrity because we evolved to do it, right? We started out quadrupeds, then we went to the trees and we swung from the trees and we're built for it. And now we sit in chairs and we don't swing from anything. <laughs> so maybe if we did a little more swinging from something overhead, our shoulders would overall hold together better. And this uh, quote, brachiate or disintegrate, that's Paul Meyer, he's one of our local legends. The guy has rehabbed his shoulders from some pretty bad uh, injuries and has come back strong. Skipping through some muscles. Rotator cuff lecture. Does anybody have questions about the rotator cuff? No, let's skip that section. We'll do it another time. Shoulder self-treatment. Stop paddling, rest, get assessed, do the PT, shoulders heal slowly. I think we covered this. Small consistent actions make the greatest difference. That's Anna Levesque for you. When do you go for surgery? This is, this is a question close to the heart of Jacob, I know. <laughs> and probably lots of other people. Uh, it was Olivia that said, not every shoulder that dislocates needs surgery. What do you guys say? Well, my, my first shoulder surgery, uh, my, my only one so far, um, was not from a dislocation at all. It was from arthritic buildup in my AC joint. Mm -hmm. uh, basically an overuse injury from a lots and lots of, of paddling on top of lot, many, many years of being a gymnast. Um, so th there's a, a lot of um, arthritis right where, where, where the acromion and the clavicle meet, where the two of them can rub together as, as you're paddling or when you're doing things in gymnastics. And this is also a very common uh, swimmer's injury as well. I just got just a classic shoulder overuse injury. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, the, the only real solution to that to kind of alleviate the pain and allow you to use your, your shoulder to its full extent is surgery. I mean, you can get some steroid injections to numb it up, uh, but that the, the more you do that, um, the more you risk future damage. Mm -hmm. um, so again, the, uh, one thing that's kind of interesting to think about that unfortunately we don't really have a whole lot of time in this talk to get into is just the, the multitude of different types of shoulder injuries 
and kind of the, the different ways to, to treat them because there, there's the, the, the overuse, tendonitis, tendinosis, dislocation, subluxation, and so on. And, and each each individual injury has its own individual treatment that that needs that needs to be done. Um, mm -hmm. But like, like like we said earlier, PT. PT, PT, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Don't be a slacker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and these are great. And stretchy bands. Lots lifelong, of stretchy bands. Lifelong PT. Or I, I showed Jacob earlier, I use a rock for my shoulder workouts. I just, for the, at least for the internal rotation part of the um, rotator cuff maintenance. But I think the key here is that if you're considering surgery, you should discuss your questions with an orthopedic surgeon, but you should also know that a surgeon is going to think about surgery. And so you need to find a surgeon that you trust to uh, support you in conservative care if you want to try that and it's a reasonable option for your injury. Don't get railroaded, I guess is all I'm saying. Don't let them run you. Here's some of the standard surgeries that a lot of people get. Bicipital tendon, tendinesis is when they take the long head of the biceps tendon and they move it to a different place because it tends to get tattered and torn up there where it connects to the labrum. AC joint repair, that's what you had, right, Jacob? And people, mountain bikers, kayakers that go mountain biking, they tear up their AC joints all the time. Rotator cuff repair is really common. Uh, that bone on the top of the shoulder is the acromion process, and they'll sometimes take arthritis from the underside of that, take it out. They'll stitch up your labrum. A friend of mine got a shoulder replacement and seems to be just fine. And there's a doctor up in Washington that does this thing called a smooth and move where he doesn't actually change anything. He just goes in and cleans house. He cleans up the shoulder. So that's an interesting idea too. One thing to add to that one, Teresa, uh, and, and so also on the other side of when to consider surgery, I think, you know, you, you kind of have, nobody's the same, but it kind of depends on what you want to do afterwards. You know, if you're at a point where maybe kayaking is not as important to you anymore, a lot of times you can recover fully and do everyday activities. You can go ride your bike. You can do a lot of other stuff without having surgery, but you know, one thing to consider, um, especially, you know, with the dislocations in particular, um, if you have an unstable shoulder, if you dislocate your shoulder mountain bike and, you know, it's a, it, it hurts, it sucks, it's a tough day. Um, if you dislocate your shoulder kayaking, there are certain situations where that can actually get you killed. Um, and so that is something to, that you do have to consider, you know, if you're going to continue kayaking and, and you want to keep running, you know, class four or five block water or even class three, you know, there's, you can die in that too. Um, if your shoulder comes out mid rapid in a dangerous rapid, even if you didn't necessarily do anything wrong, that can be a really dire situation. Um, so that's just something to take into account when you're, um, you know, trying to decide whether you want to go to surgery or not is what are your goals after, you know, what are your goals after recovery? Um, and then regarding the surgeries, um, for one, you know, get like, like the last bullet there, get a surgeon that you trust, um, I was lucky enough to be able to be treated for my last two surgeries um, at the Stedman Clinic in Colorado, and they're a top-notch facility, um, and really approached everything with a completely different attitude than I'd ever had uh, on my first two surgeries, um, and a completely different surgery, and they did the, I'm probably going to butcher the way you say this, my southern accent, but I believe it's pronounced the La Targe procedure, um, and for dislocations in particular, um, you know, my, my surgeon there at the Stedman Clinic went straight to that as the option. Um, and, and they really move a lot of stuff around. Um, you know, I, I think they actually like saw a piece of, I think it's called the coracoid process. They take the coracoid process off of your collarbone and they actually bolt it underneath. Um, so you have like a bone block underneath your uh, surgery and they do something with the bicep tendon. I'm not going to try to get into it because it's way over my head, but, um, but it's a great surgery and, um, uh, something that I've heard a few other paddlers with, um, you know, reoccurring dislocations have had it with pretty good success as well. And I think it's a newer surgery maybe that that's only been being practiced in this, uh, situation over the last, you know, several, I'm, I'm sure it's been around for a few years, but it's seems to be becoming more common. So just wanted to add that in. 
Interesting. Yeah. So when you said they came in with a different attitude, how was their attitude so different from the previous times? Well, so my first two surgeries were, um, it, they were just orthoscopic surgeries and um, they essentially just kind of went in and, you know, tied the stuff that had blown out back together and didn't, didn't really do very much beyond that. They didn't really clean up a whole lot and it was just a, um, you know, I, it's kind of hard to describe, but it, it just wasn't necessarily what I needed. You know, I, I knew after both of those surgeries that I still wasn't there. Like I knew I was never going to be there. I had to continue to protect myself in a different manner um, than my previous injuries. Um, now, granted, they, you know, my left shoulder, when you were there, that was the first dislocation, full blown like dislocation that I'd had in over a decade. Um, and it was the only one that I'd had post-op, but I'd had s several like subluxes and several tweaks. And so I knew my shoulder, I knew it was almost bound to happen at some point. It just needed me. I just needed to mess up one time for it to happen. Um, <laughs> Darn it. And, and so it was just kind of a different, uh, you know, the, the, the surgeon came in with this, like, I've never had a shoulder fail before kind of attitude and, um, it, it was just a very different experience that I had versus the Stedman Clinic. And, you know, they came in understanding that I was a kayaker, understanding that I wanted to continue to kayak and understanding the forces that kayaking applies to your shoulders and having a doctor that understood what my goals were and selecting the surgery that was going to get me back to doing the things that I wanted to do. Happy endings. Exactly. Yeah, oh, Teresa, yeah. you just said the magic word. <laughs> well, this is the last slide. Oh my god, we can yeah. we can skip it, but you know, it's things that pretty much everybody knows that your shoulders like to be warmed up and they like to be strong before they go paddling. So warm them up and strengthen them. And uh, oh, that was Jacob's idea. The thing about paddling backwards as a something for shoulder strengthening. Yeah, yeah kind of, it's very similar to what Anna was saying about how we're um, uh, just kind of keeping an evenness in how we strengthen and use our, our muscles. So as, as paddlers, we always want to like paddle faster or we're, we're surfing a wave forwards or we're trying to get to the, the takeout beers faster than, than the person behind you. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're always thinking about paddling forward. So we're exercising our muscles in, in one way. Yeah. Um, but in order to really strengthen your shoulder, think about paddling backwards, just like take flat water or in an eddy. And just when, when you're on the water, take 20 to 40 backwards strokes at a time. And it, it, if you start doing that, like, again, small, small and consistent action, you'll, you'll start to see a difference in how your shoulders feel on the water and as your, your strength and your overall just power behind your paddle stroke in general. I agree with that. And it's an excellent tip to end on. Thank you. I love it. You all, um, I mean, it, it is a happy ending in that you shared so much valuable and useful information. Um, you know, uh, I kind of felt like throughout the evening we had two different kinds of people, right? The kind who were like, oh, yeah, let me tell you about the time my shoulder, you know, <laughs> and uh, hanging on every word and, you know, misery loves company. And then the other half of us like, oh my God, you know, I hope that never happens to me. And I'm, you know, scribbling furious notes to take, you know, take note of everything I can do to make sure it doesn't. So, um, you know, you're, you guys had the, the, the difficult task of, of serving both groups and you did it so well. So thank you so, so much. Um, we did not, there was so much information to cover. We barely took questions. So, um, I have one from Ken coming directly to me saying, Deborah, did you get my email? Yes, I did. Um, but if there are if there are questions that you absolutely must get answered before we say goodnight, I'm sure that our panelists will hang out for just a second or two. And of course, we've gone so over. So if you need to say goodnight, by all means, say goodnight. But if there's anything that, that folks want to make sure we answer, just put it in the chat real quick. I just want to say too that uh, Dr. Jesse Stone gave us a couple more videos than we were able to show tonight. And I will make sure those links are up on the uh, schedule so that you can see those along with uh, viewing this recording if you need to. Yes. Perfect. Thank you, Teresa.
Um, and we will, of course, send the recording out you know, to the full group that registered. And as Teresa said, the recording will include links to some of the videos we didn't get to. Um, yes. And I really appreciate my panelists showing up early and staying late. For Thank sure. you, Gavin, Olivia, Jacob. Anna's gone. Yeah, but um, yeah. Can the other Perfect. videos, at least one of Ken's asking, what were the other videos that, that we'll be sending out? One for sure. One could... is on how to um, uh, sort of rehab your supraspinatus after an injury or to begin to build strength in the supraspinatus. It's pretty basic side-lying exercises. And the other one is an external rotation with the band like this for the two muscles in the rotator cuff that are external rotators. Um, and it's very short. So that one's very short. The supraspinatus one is a couple minutes long. And it's good. And she looks like she's in a very warm, lovely place wherever she is. Yeah, um, Anna knew where she was. She wrote it in the chat. Yep. I think, I think Jesse's been in Uganda working for the last Uganda, few years. Uganda, yeah. So yeah, de definitely not the, the warm tropical Pacific Northwest. Yeah. <laughs> Man, the weather has been crazy here. Ken's requesting one on necks. Ooh, that would be good. On necks? Yeah. Hmm, where am I gonna find a neck expert? Are you volunteering, Ken? <laughs> he didn't, didn't even need to unmute himself. <laughs> His answer was clear. All right. All right. I think that we do probably um, do not yeah. have any more questions. <laughs> it's because you covered so much content. And well, you yeah, and everyone that you know couldn't handle it is long gone. <laughs> All right. Um, a thank you to our panelists again, as Teresa said. And um, yeah, sit up straight, everybody. Who I work on it all the time. Yeah, don't forget. Okay. All right. Good night. Join the LCCC. Oh, See and you next it. time. Because <laughs> you could win prizes like Ken Goldberg. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.